Okay, so welcome to the, the last installment this fall of the Social Science Occasional Lecture Series. Um, I am Michelle Rodriguez, I teach at Political Science. And I want to welcome Ken Berger, who teaches uh, geography here, he's been teaching here since 2000. And he is uh, currently working on the Graduate Gemologist designation at the Gemological Institute of America, and that's in Carlsbad, it's one of, one of the foremost institutions in the United States, I guess, or in the world. Um, he's been working on that for some time and hopes to complete it. And eventually, yeah. <laughs> eventually, and yeah, make a little money off this. Um, okay, so he's going to talk to us about the about gemology of the four C's: clarity, color, cut, and carrot. Thank you, Michelle. Um, the four C's. Maybe you've heard of them mentioned when you were buying an engagement ring. Maybe a diamond solitaire or earrings or some other type of jewelry. Perhaps you even know that the four C's stand for clarity, color, cut, and carry. So what I hope to do in this lecture is to discuss these four qualities of gemstones and some other related important factors. Well, the first thing we should say is, what is a gem? Well, most of the minerals, in other words, natural materials with a specific chemical composition, some are organic, pearls, amber, coral and ivory. Uh, the rest are inorganic. I'm sure these are the ones you're most interested in. Topaz, sapphire, emerald, ruby, and all the other good ones. And diamonds. And even though they are made of carbon, which would mean they're organic, they are a, a special case. So let's first see how we, how we classify gems. Well, first, at the highest level, we have classes and that's based upon the mineralogy, the, uh, the chemical makeup of the individual gem. And we find there's eight classes plus one class of non-minerals, such as amber, as I'm passing around, onyx, and stuff like that. Then we have groups. Uh, these minerals have similar characteristics, and there's a commercial classification, and there's about a total of five of them. Then as we go farther down, we have species. This is based on the specific chemical composition and the structure of it. Uh, for example, corundum is a, a species, and that's a combination of aluminum and oxygen. And then we finally come to variety, and quite often variety is based on color. So for example, we have ruby and sapphires. These are both corundum, but ruby contains um, chromium, whereas sapphire contains iron and titanium. So if we take a look here, there we can see rubies. Uh, rough, and this is rough, and so these are cut rubies here. And as I said, sapphire is also corundum, but it contains iron and titanium. And there we have sapphires. And notice, look at all the colors of sapphires, they're not just blue. Until we have modern mineralogy, gems were classified by color. But you can't do it by color anymore. I mean, as I said, look, look at these, they're all sapphires. So you can't classify by color anymore. You have to go through various types of chemical analysis to actually know what you're buying. Aquamarine and emerald. These are both varieties of beryl. Okay, aquamarine contains iron, uh, and uh, uh, right. aquamarine contains iron, and beryl contains either chromium or vanadium. So if we look here, on the left we have aquamarine, on the right, we have beryl. Oh, uh, sorry. On, on, on the right, we have emerald, and these are both forms of beryl. Just by the different trace elements in it, we find we have different colors and a different makeup. Amethyst and citron. These are varieties of quartz. Okay, so the first contains iron. The next one contains aluminum and iron. So if we look here, there we have the amethyst on the left and the citron on the right. A oh, very strange type of cut on that, as you can see. Now, besides variety being based on color, they might also be based on transparency. For example, we have carnelian and jasper. These are varieties of chalcedony. And these are, whereas carnelian is somewhat transparent, jasper is opaque. So here we have a bunch of them together, where the opaque ones are the um, jasper and the transparent ones are the carnelian. 
might also be based on something we call phenomenon. These are various types of unusual optical effects. Um, asterism, okay, so for example on asterism, <coughs> here we have a star sapphire, and we can have a star ruby. <coughs> now is that light reflection or is it from the other side? No, it's light reflection. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you look at it, you'll, you'll actually see that there. It's not coming from the reverse, no. Gotcha. Cat's eye. Here we see, uh, this is a crystal barrel, so we can see a cat's eye. And on some of these, as you turn it, the eye will open and close, depending upon the way the light is hitting it. The eye will open and close. Change of color. Now, this is a very fascinating one. I mentioned this to a friend of mine, and because he wanted to buy something for his uh, fiancée, and I said, this is a great thing to buy. Get something with change of color. So we have an alexandrite uh, here. Um, it changes color depending upon what light you're under. Uh, under the on the incandescent light, it's red, and on the fluorescent light, it's uh, more greenish blue. In fact, they call this emerald by day, ruby by night. Mm -hmm. And and this has to do with the refraction of how the light goes in there and that. Okay. And I guess if you go in and you ask for alexandrite, people think you're in the know, and they don't mess with you, according to what my my colleague told me. And so is that because of how it's cut, or just what's inside it? It's what's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's what's inside it. Okay. It's inside it. And then, depending on the cut, you can get a more vivid effect, or a less vivid effect. But it's not just Alexandrite, uh, which came out, out of, originally came out, out of Russia, but other ones would be, here's color chain sapphire. These are sapphires that change colors. Again, under incandescent light on the left, and under fluorescent light on the right. In fact, we also find that a garnet, some garnets can change color too. So I think these are kind of uh, interesting stones. We can also have what we call play of color, right there, where we have our opal. So that's how we would classify the um, varieties. Now, gem traits. All gems contain three important traits. One is beauty. As they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so it's difficult to categorize what we mean by beauty. Uh, we could say maybe it's a combination of the qualities that delight the senses or appeals to the mind. But beauty is a combination of three categories. One is color. Oh, what happened to my color? Color. And what we find is gemstones come in a variety of colors. These are all tourmalines. These are all tourmalines. And you can see how they come in a variety of colors. It's also based upon symmetry, which is a balance and harmony of the cut, and the surface appearance or the luster. How does the gem appear in reflected light? The second trait is how rare is the gem? Some are quite common, some are very rare. And durability. Durability, the ability to withstand wear, to withstand heat, Chemicals, and don't think of chemicals like in the scientific lab, but such as lotions, perfumes, hairspray, cosmetics, all of these is what we mean by chemicals. For example, fluoride, which is a very pretty gem if you, um, you, know, if you fasten it in that, has very bad uh, durability. Durability consists of various parts. Hardness. What is its resistance to scratching and abrasion? Toughness, which is different from hardness, that's its resistance to breaking, chipping, and cracking. For example, topaz has good hardness, but poor toughness. So there we have some pictures of, uh, these are all topaz. These are all topaz. And as I said, this has good hardness, but poor toughness. Jadeite, it's not as hard, but it has exceptional toughness. Uh, stability, it's resistance to light, heat, and chemicals. For example, sunlight can fade kunzite, and clearing solutions can damage peridot. So if we look here, here we have examples of kunzite, and as I said, the light can fade this. 
and so this is not something you want to keep out in the light. That if you're in, a, if they sell it in a store, they they'll keep it more, you know, in muted light and stuff like that. And Peridot, transparency uh, can be uh, that's also part of the durability. Um, the degree to which light passes through an object. For example, emerald, garnet, and tanzite are transparent. So here we have the garnet group. Uh, we see a wide variety of colors. Same crystal structure, but the chemical compositions are slightly different. Many times the colors are determined by just a trace element, a small amount. Here we have the um, tanzanite. This is tanzanite. Now, is that truly found only in Tanzania? I, no, I think it's found in other places now. But originally, originally, they named it after where they found it. Sure. Yeah. Another one, hematite and turquoise, these are opaque. So if we look here, is that? Yeah, that's hematite. That's hematite. And. Opal has varying degrees of transparency, and we've already seen our opal before. Now, how about the value of the gems? Okay, so we just got done looking at the traits. How about the value? Well, value is based on a combination of features, the four C's. Clarity, color, cut, and carrot. So what do I mean by clarity? Clarity is the relative absence of inclusions. These are internal features. For example, a crystal included in it, a fluid, a break. Um, if we look here, you can see all the different types of inclusions. A bearded girdle, bruise, cavity, chip, cloud, feather, included crystal, needle, laser drill hole. These are all types of inclusions. The other thing would be blemishes. These are surface irregularities, such as scratches and nicks. And here we see a whole list of various surface irregularities. Abrasions, extra facet, lizard skin, natural nick. Now, if your stone has blemishes, those are easy to remove by repolishing. But if you have inclusions, those are difficult to remove. Uh, in fact, many times they can't be. And you, you can try to cover them up sometimes, but you Excuse me, aren't the emeralds supposed to have inclusions, the beautiful ones? Uh, that's, uh, for many stones, that's the only way you can tell that they're uh, natural and not artificially made based upon inclusions. And inclusions don't have to be a bad thing. They could be a good thing because, as I said, one way it can identify the stone as being a natural stone and not a, something made but in the lab. What I'm saying, the emeralds, I was told that's the way... They yeah, normally that's the way they do it. Okay. And also, it can identify your stone as being your stone directly, very, because sure. I'll, I'll point around something, I'll hand something out uh, in a little while, and by matching your stone to the various inclusions, you'll know it's your stone, because every stone will have their own unique fingerprint, shall we say. Clarity factors. Well, the size. How big is the blemish or the inclusion? How many are there? Where is it located? You know, is it right on the table, or is it on the pavilion, or where? Uh, what type of uh, clarity of problem is it? And how easy is it to see? So for example, here, you would get a shot uh, if you had your things uh, certified, where they would identify the various inclusions with various marks. Okay. Now, um, this is the, this is used, uh, this one here is used for diamonds, and this is what the Geological Institute of America uses. Now, if you, uh, if you had diamonds and you want to get them certified, I would recommend you only go to one or two places. You either get a GIA certified, Geological Institute of America, or you get the European Gemological Lab. Now, up until a few years ago, if your diamond was less than a carat, you didn't have much choice. You had to take it to EGL, European Gemological Lab, because GIA would not um, dirty the hand for small stuff. Um, but now they will do small things, okay? Many stores will sell things to say that your diamonds are certified, and they'll mention some oddball outfit. Don't even wait, it's not even worth the money it's printed on. The GIA grading system for diamonds, now please know I'm combining diamonds and colored stones together. When GIA grades it, they have 10 grades going from flawless 
to I2, included two. So you would go flawless, internally flawless, which you can have a surface blemish, but not that, right? VBS1, very, very slight one, VBS2, VS1, VS2, S1, S2, I1, I2. And the way they do it is they use a 10 power magnification, okay? But most people uh, would use a 20 power magnification. So if you can't see it under a 20, you definitely can't see it under a 10. And then there's no question about it. Because if you use a 10 and I use a 10, you might say you see it and I might say I don't. But if we both use a 20, then there's no way it can be seen under a 10. Um, now, note, although viewed as a detriment, as I just pointed out, that, uh, these various um, clarity factors can be served to identify natural gems from simulants. For example, by using them, you can identify diamond versus glass, or zircon, or YAG, yttrium aluminum garnet, or GGG, gadolium gallium garnet, or CZ, synthetic cubic zirconia, or synthetic mosinite. So many times, it, it helps identify that it is a real gem in that. Let's look at color. Color is based on tone, the darkness and lightness, and the saturation, the intensity. Diamonds, uh, at least on the GIA, uh, and also on the EGL, are graded from D to Z. Uh, ABC is not used, because, and I looked into why. The reason is, at the beginning, many people were using A, B, C, A1, A2, uh, A, AA, AAA, and, and to um, eliminate confusion, when the GIA developed their system, they said, let's start with D. Okay, so if we look, here you can kind of see how the color uh, changes, and as you get more pure, the price goes up. Okay. Uh, diamonds also, though, come in other colors, known as fancy colored. For example, they can come in orange, which are the most rare. They can come in blue, pink and blue. For example, the famous Hope Diamond is a blue diamond. They can come in yellow and brown. Now, if you remember, when we looked at the other one, we went from a yellowish to a clear. If you get to a very dark yellow, you're now beyond that scale of D to Z, and you're now into the fancy colors, okay? When the yellow and brown are the most common there. And these, the fancy colors, are graded from what they call faint to deep. How about cut? Well, a cut consists of three things. It consists of brilliance, a combination of all the white light reflections from the surface and inside, especially in diamonds. Fire, flashes of color as you look at it, especially in diamonds. Scintillation, flashes of light when the gem or the light source or the observer is moved. And these are determined by proportions, the relationship between the dimensions and the angles of the facets, the smooth faces that have been cut. Based upon the finish, how well they are done, and the polish, in other words, the overall condition of the facet surfaces, and finish is graded from excellent to poor, five grades, uh, and finish is also involved with the symmetry, how precise, and what is the balance of the cut, and it uses the same five grades. So for example, if we look here, here we can see parts of a round brilliant diamond, the flat part on the top is the table. The part, uh, the, the upper part here is the girdle. Oh, sorry, this is the girdle here. This is the crown. This is the pavilion. The little pointy end down here is called the couplet. Now, they do have names for each of these different facets, too, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture. How about the cut shapes? Well, we basically have the round shape and the fancy shape all the other shapes that other than round. So here we have all different shapes. These are all fancy shapes. So baguette, square, square antique, square step, heart, pear, oval, marquise, all those there. So you can see you have all different shapes. How about the styles of cut? Well, you can have brilliant, where the facets radiate out from the center. You can have step, where you have concentric rows of facets. And you can have mixed. 
So if we look here, here you can see the Brilliant Cut, which is the most standard cut. If you're going to buy something and you want to maintain the value of it, especially for diamonds, you want to go with the Brilliant Cut. Uh, yes, the other ones might be nice, a heart might be nice, a case might be nice. Those cuts are pretty, but they're harder to sell if you ever want to sell the things. Uh, the Brilliant is the nice, a round Brilliant Cut is the best to hold its value in that. Now, for various other gems, such as emeralds, you would not want that. You'd want more the rectangular cut, your standard cut for emeralds. Uh, there's other styles. There's the cabochons. Smoothly polished gem with a dome top and a flatter curved base. So if we, uh, oh, we have the intaglio, flat with the design engraved into the surface. We have the cameo, a figure over a woman's profile sculpted to, produce, to project slightly from the flat surface. So if here, here we have the three types of calves, cabochons, uh, the simple, the double cab, and uh, the buff top. The, the last C is carrot, or the weight. And one carrot is 0.2 grams, or 200 milligrams. Or, if we look, one ounce is about 142 carrots. And carrots get divided into 100 points. And when they weigh them, what you do is you weigh out to the thousand position, and then you round to the hundredth, okay? So you, weigh, so you weigh it out to the thousands and you round to the hundredth. Well, that is briefly things on some colored gems and also on uh, diamonds. But another important type of gem would be the pearls. Uh, so what is a pearl? It's a nacreous, organic gem formed in the body of a mollusk. And we have natural pearls, formed without human assistance. Um, most of uh, pearls and jewelry now are cultured pearls. Unless you get antique jewelry, you're really not gonna find a natural pearl. Okay, unless possibly a freshwater pearl. And we have the cultured pearl, formed as a result of human intervention in the formation process. Uh, and what they do is you have two types of, cultured pearl was developed around the 1920s, Okay, around the 1920s. Uh, Mickey Moto, maybe you've heard of that name in terms of pearls. He was one of the major people who, who came up with the cultured pearl process and that. And they do it one of two ways. They do bead nucleation and tissue nucleation. So they don't, don't really stick a grain of sand in the pearl, as most people think. On the bead nucleation, uh, what you do is you take a piece of a shell, okay? Normally from a freshwater mussel from North America. Take a tiny piece of a shell, you take a piece of the mantle tissue from the host oyster and put the two of them into the gonad. Okay, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, I guess it hurts. Uh, and then it'll form a pearl around it. Tissue nucleation is used for freshwater, okay, ones. And here you just take a piece of the tissue and you put it into the mantle. Okay, you don't put it into the gonad. Um, we have different types of pearls. We have the Akoya pearl. This is what we think of when we think of pearls. Your white or cream pearl. Some have a hint of pink or green. Usually less than nine millimeters in size. It comes from the oyster uh, Pinctata fucata. Uh, here. And this is why they, a lot of them, they come out of Japan. And here we have the nice um, Akoya pearls. The, then, we have the Tahitian pearls. These have only been on the market since the 70s. Their color is anywhere, um, eggplant, uh, purple, peacock, green, metallic, gray, grayish blue. And these are larger. These go up to 14 millimeters, and these come from the oyster Pinctata margaritifera. Then, we have the, um, the South Sea pearls. These are even larger, 15 millimeters or larger. Pinctata maxima. Um, the Akoya is primarily from Japan. The Tahitian uh, comes from French Polynesia. The South Sea comes from the Philippines and Australia. And if we look at this one, here we have that one. 
And finally, we have our freshwater pearls. A uh, wide variety of color, two millimeters to 13 millimeters. And there's freshwater pearls. Primarily, they come out of China, Japan, and the US. Um, and they use um, other types of mussels. There are two other types of pearls which do not have the naked covering. One comes from the conch, and the other one comes from the male male snap. Okay, and these are a special type of pearl and do not have the naked covering, but they're quite pretty. What is the value factors when we're looking at our pearls? Well, size, spherical, uh, can range from two millimeters to 20 millimeters in diameter with irregularly shaped ones reaching 50 millimeters. So we have to look at that. We have to look at shape. There's seven standard shapes. Round, near round, Oval, button, drop, semi-baroque, non-symmetrical, off-round, slightly irregular oval, button or drop, and baroque, non-symmetrical shape, has an irregular appearance. Now, you might find a pearl with other shapes. For example, it might have a bar or a cross or a stick. Well, there, would be some examples. There we see the round, the near round, the oval, the button, the drop, semi-baroque, baroque. And then these here, with the um, other shape, you basically name them based upon what they look like. Uh, I know over in China, they would insert little statues of Buddha into it. And then when they'd come out, they'd have these little pearl Buddhas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'd actually do that. How about the color? That's the next value factor. There's three main parts when we look at color. We have the body color. This is your dominant color, your overall color. And these can be neutrals, white, gray, or black, near neutrals, silver, cream, or brown, and hues. These are all your other fancy colors, and 19 are recognized by the Gemological Institute of America. So here you can see neutrals, near neutrals, and some of the hues there. Then overtone, one or more translucent colors that appear over the pearl's body color. So you have the main body color, then you see this kind of funny type of an overtone on top of it. Not quite, you say, gee, it doesn't quite look white, but it has kind of like a, a pinkish color covering to it. And finally, orient, iridescent. Rainbow colors that shimmering on or just below the pearl surface. So here we can see the body color is the dominant color. Overtones. Uh, so here, obviously, you can see this as a black body color, but if you look, you can kind of see a greenish or a little bit of a purplish overtone to it. And there, the orient, you, you can kind of see the rainbow to it there. Luster is another value factor. This is the most important of all the value factors. And they get rated from excellent to good to fair to poor. So here, if we look, you can even tell from this how much nicer the luster is on this. You, know, you can really see those, uh, those hues and that and the, and the overtones. Here, it's not as clear. Here, it's kind of rough. Surface quality. Clean, lightly blemished, moderately blemished, heavily blemished. For example, it could have an abrasion, a bump, a chip, a crack, a, a flat area, a gap, a pit, a scratch, a spot, a wrinkle. So if we look here, here you can see some various types of abrasions. Gaps, where the naked didn't cover, has spots on it, has bumps on it, here you can see the bumps there, has wrinkles in it for that. Naked quality. How acceptable is it? Uh, uh, wait, all right, pause. Is it acceptable? Can you see the nucleus? The thing that they implanted to make it, or does it have a chalky appearance? So it's one of these three. Matching, now this would only uh, involve if you had like a string of pearls, okay? How well do they match? And one of the things you can do with a string of pearls is look for blinkers. You take the pearls and go like this, twist them. And if they blink at you, 
that means the naked quality is not uniform. Because by blinking at you, that means on part of the pearl, the nucleus is not that far down and it's kind of like showing through. We're well, not showing through, but it's not covered enough. So if, you, so if you take your string of pearls and go like this, and you see one of them blinking at you, you know the naked quality is not uniform. So these are some things that you can look at. But the thing to keep in mind here for gems is that you can't go by color, okay, when you're gonna buy a gem. Um, so if you're gonna buy one, you better trust the people you're buying from, okay? Um, if, uh, if you're gonna spend a lot of money, you wanna get certification. Now, I do not know if the EGL certifies um, colored stones. They do certify diamonds. GIA will certify colored stones, okay? If your certification is not from GIA or not from EGL, about the only one I might accept would be AGS, American Gemological Society. But many people, for example, if I finish this program, I will have graduate gemology certification. And I can go and work for a store. And they'll say, oh yeah, all pearls are certified by a GIA graduate gemologist. And I will write a piece of paper. And I've certified it. That's not worth the paper it's printed on. You want it certified by the GIA itself, where, the, where, you, where it's sent in, and you have a number of people looking at it. And then it's a consensus. That is basically my talk. I'll, I'll entertain questions now. Yes? Um, I have a couple unrelated questions. Just a quick one. With uh, I hear my friend saying, well, I wouldn't accept if I'm getting engaged anything less than a something something carrot. What would be considered, uh, you know? OK. Um, like a, okay, like a $50,000 yeah, yeah. diamond. OK, in diamonds, in diamonds, it's not a nice, even slope going up. Mm -hmm. They have magic numbers. Oh, OK. The magic numbers are a quarter carat, half a carat, three quarters of a carat, and one quarter of a carat. So if you have something that's a 0.99 carat versus a 1.0 carat, the price will be a, a tremendous jump, a, a tremendous oh, wow. jump in price uh, you, you would find. Um, so what's like a two carat diamond? Is that big? Yeah, that's pretty big. That's pretty big. Now, you see, but you want to look at everything. I remember I had a friend, and he got married, and his wife wanted a big diamond. Mm -hmm. And he went out and got a, like a five-carat diamond. Uh -huh. Huge. But the clarity was so bad, you could be sitting there, and I could almost see the inclusion in it. Yeah. So, like, for example, I went out years ago, and I bought some diamonds for investment. I bought a 33-point, third of a carat, and two 25-points but very high quality, very, high, very good color, and, a, and, and really excellent uh, clarity, DVS-1, okay? And I had them put in the earrings and a pen and gave it to my wife, oh. and she looked at it and goes, but it's not a big one. Yeah. I said, fine, what do you want? Do you want something of high quality, or do you want a big yeah. one that's of low quality? Yeah. See, so just because it, but, and many, not to be sexist, but many women think, at least in terms of diamonds, bigger is better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's not necessarily true. Yeah. Quality is important. I'd much rather have a high quality diamond, you know, if it's smaller than a big one that's Let, not. Let's say uh, the, yeah. the quality's good. Great. Okay, great. Um, what would be, you know, to, to be like, one knock your eyes out in terms of carrots and size, uh, given well, it's a good quality? Uh, one carrot is only what you started, but then again, you can go for a 0.98 or a 0.99 and save a tremendous amount of money, and you really won't notice the difference uh -huh. in size. And also, you have to look at the mounting that it's put in. So what, Various mountings right. will make it look bigger than others. So yeah. a one carat diamond ring in a nice setting of good quality, should what would be a good price? I have no idea. Oh. I'm not up on the no. cost of things. I can't help you on price. Price I've never been concerned about. I'm and looking. then my second question yeah, sure. was, um, because I make jewelry and I go sure, to sure. Uh, uh, bead stores all the time. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, they have stones. And, and so the, the basic question is, what is the difference between a precious stone and uh, a semi-precious they, uh, stone? They should not use those words. Those are passe. OK. The word precious and semi should not be used anymore. So it's just in the, in the, in the criteria that you've given us is all that we want. Right, for. right. I so mean, the more those things, the cut and the color. Right, exactly. Um, nowadays, among gemologists, 
precious and semi-precious are meaningless. Ah. They should not be used because you have a lot of rare ones which are just as expensive as like your ruby or sapphire. Okay, but no, it's terms that should not be used anymore. Okay, so it's more just in terms of what you want exactly. and what you want exactly. to look at and what exactly. you appreciate. I mean, you know, your classic precious stones were diamond, ruby, right. emerald, sapphire. And then anything else is sapphire. Right, yeah, but that's not valid anymore. Uh, personally, I'd much rather have a color change Alexandrite. Right. Yeah, I think, because I think that's kind of interesting, yeah. than a ruby or a sapphire mm -hmm. or an emerald, because I think it's kind of nice already to change colors in that. Yeah. Um, so no, I, so I would not use those terms. And if they use those yeah. terms, they're definitely not up on it. Okay. Yes. Um, this is kind of a maybe déjà vu idea, but I, no, I I, I was uh, yeah. I was thinking, you know, that uh, emerald is is green and yeah. ruby is red. Right. And Sapphire, Sapphire is blue. blue. Basically, this is not. No, that's not true. Because basically, you have all the stones of all the colors, correct? That's right. Okay, so you can have topaz that is green. All right, that's I'm just you know yeah, hard that, to, true. to get so, out of that kind of right. Uh, so, for example, uh, Angela mm -hmm. uh, Obergau came up to me the other day mm -hmm. and showed me how this stone because unfortunately she couldn't make the talk, and she said, "Guess what this is?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I looked at it; it was a purplish color stone. I said, "I have no idea what it is." You know, I said, it might be, I said, I guess it's a topaz. She goes, no, it's a tanzanite. Mm -hmm. You can't tell by going by color. Okay. The color is meaningless. And so the key is, you better know who you're buying it from. Absolutely. Or, or else if you buy it, you better run all the tests on it. Okay. Which is if I finish the program, I learn how to do the tests in that. Doesn't mean I'll be able to do it because I don't have the equipment. But I'll learn how to do that. And, uh, but that's the only way, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, I also heard the ruby is, yeah. at least according to the Europeans, is the one that is the rarest. So because it's, 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 it's kind of distinguishing faster than others. Is that correct? I haven't heard it's Maybe being... Maybe because they want you to sell it? I, I would say so. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the people you're with, what's considered like rare diagonal, for example. The pigeon, it, what's called the pigeon blood is beautiful. Right, it's yes, very that's rare. very nice. But like, for example, when I lived in Taiwan, mm -hmm. jade was important. Jade. Jade was a big thing. I mean, much more important than your ruby or sapphire. They all wanted jade. And, th and then when I was in mainland China, there was this thing called bloodstone. Mm -hmm. And it's a gray with a reddish in it. Personally, I think it's an ugly looking thing. But to them, it's highly valuable. So I would say it depend depends upon the individual. The Europeans put more weight in certain stones than Americans do in that. So, uh, yeah. Okay, last question sure. about pearls. Uh, we were told when we were little in Europe to wear it all the time because the pearls get sick. And so Because it, they, if you don't get close to the skin, they get sick. If you leave it in the drawer, no. It's not okay, okay. Uh, okay, if you leave it in the drawer, you want... Uh, get oh, right. yellowish. Well, no, no, no. No. If you leave it in the drawer, you don't want it in a very dry environment. Right. Okay? You want to take them out and clean them every now and then. But if you wear it constantly, Pearls, your body oils are going to slowly start to oh, ruin them okay. in that. So pearls, for example, if you're wearing pearls, it should be the last thing you put on. Right. After your makeup, after your perfume, the pearls should be the last thing you put on. When you take them off, you should wipe them off. Oh. If you wear them regularly, yeah. you should get them restrung once a year and not wait the 25 years. All right, thank you. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, once but again. Once a year, it's but, impossible. It costs tons to restrain pearls now. Does it? I haven't done oh, yes. it. I wanted to take that course, but they only offer it in New York. They don't offer it out there for some reason. Very, very, very costly. Yeah, yeah Alan. Alan. There seems to be a, a, a lot of laboratory created gems now. Yes. Mm -hmm. How yes. has this affected the overall market for gems? Um, some of the laboratory created gems are nicer looking than the real ones, and you know, it comes down to if, say you bought the laboratory created gem and you gave it to your fiance or whoever, I mean, unless she took it and had it tested, she wouldn't know. Um, so that's why uh, some of these things are so good that even GIA, who has all the fancy equipment, has had difficulty identifying some stuff. And they've had stuff sent to them because I get their newsletter of that, their monthly newsletter, where major uh, jewelers and that have thought these things were real and sent it up there and they ran through all these tests and only finally maybe one test proved that it was not real and that. But no, they're getting much better because people don't want inclusions. They don't want blemishes, so they come up with it. 
So, you know, how is it affecting the market? You have to really know what you're buying. You know, you really have to know what, what you're buying. You can't go and, you know, the guy opens up his trunk and say, okay, which one you want? Or here, yeah. I got a bunch of watches with gems on it. Uh, <laughs> are the, are the um, stores required to tell you that these are chemically produced or produced in a lab? By law, yes. To yes, by law, yes. Yes, they, they must tell you. It, it would seem to me that it, there should be a significant price difference in something dug from the ground. Yes, there and is. something okay. created. Yeah, yes, there is. And, and by law, they are required to tell you. By law. But by but, law, they're required to stop at stop signs, too. That's right. That's right. So, but, well, I don't know. But by law, in fact, they have to be very careful. Uh, by law, according to the FTC, the Federal uh, Trade Commission, as to how they describe things. For example, uh, they like uh, if it's artificially made, they must tell you it's artificially made. They can't say this is a sapphire. They have to tell you it's an artificially made sapphire. Uh, if it's an artificially made diamond, they can't call it diamond. Can't call it sapphire. Um, they must uh, also, like for example, if you're buying something and they say, okay, this is a quarter carat, it better weigh exactly 25 points. Now, among trade people. Okay, you and I are in the same trade. I might say it's a quarter carat, and that could be anywhere from 23 to 28 points. There'd be no problem. But if they're selling to the public, they say it's a half carat, it better be 50 points. They're very specific. I never now, again, that's in the U.S. Well, I've never bought anything on QVC or those, those, right. those places Nate, on TV yeah. that, that you can buy. And I just can't imagine that that is a quality well, anything. Well, no, because they avoid things. I mean, uh, so what are the words? What are the key words I should look for? Cut. No, 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 no. You said that there were some terms that they cannot use legally. You know, to uh, if they're going to call it a diamond, it better be a natural diamond. If they're going to call it a sapphire, it better be a natural sapphire. Like, or they'll or sometimes they'll say just like a diamond, okay? Well, or they'll call it yeah. like, or they'll call it. <laughs> Or they'll call it, oh, or they'll say, hey, these are Olivia's diamonds. That's a modifying thing right. to it. It's not a real diamond. Or, or these are Jerry's, you know, Jerry's sapphires. And, no, they, and that's how they try to get around it, by putting these things, you know, these slight things, or, or diamondite, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But on that same topic, yeah. uh, just philosophically speaking, uh, well, on the one hand, we're saying, well, the, the, the natural stone is so much more valuable than the synthetic one. But on the other hand, you're saying, well, it, it, the quality in terms of all of these criteria is so good and so high that even the experts have trouble telling the difference. Sometimes Why should we care? If that, we can get exactly the You answer that question. You answer that question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to give you an example. Years ago, when I was single and had money, I used, to have, I used to have an old British sports car, a 1952 MG. MG? It, and MG. A, 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 yeah, a 52 MG TD. It was a pain to maintain, to buy parts, to keep it running. I could have went out and bought one of those a kit cars, and it would look just like it. It would have had a nice modern engine in it. I could, I could drive it at highway speeds. I could take it to any uh, pet boys that have it serviced. But I didn't want that. I wanted the original. And it was something that's in all of us, knowing this is an original, not a reproduction. But if we start saying, oh, that's just a, that's just the one in the ground that's all flawed. Don't you want this really pretty perfect one? No. Well, then but, I'm But you're just saying that because you are, are, are yeah. tacking your belief onto something. Yeah. You, that's that's what what I got. Say you, you have just got described the type of women all men are looking for. Do they ever put uh, flaws in the artificial one? <laughs> That's the next step. Yeah. Emerald flaws. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard of them putting flaws in on purpose yet. Okay. That's a good I, idea. I, 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 have, I, I have not heard of that. But sometimes, some artificial ones will have certain flaws that are more prominent in artificial ones than natural ones in that. And lots of times, as the teacher pointed out earlier, many times that's the only way you can tell a real one mm -hmm. from an artificial one. An artificial one is just too perfect. perfect. It doesn't have a flaw. But usually in those cases, we want the real thing because it's better in some way. It, it's prettier. 
it feels better. Nowadays, it's nicer. The, it's stronger. Nowadays, the technology. It's not well, like for example, way. it's taken many years for the public to accept cultured pearls. Uh -huh. Basically, a cultured pearl is the same as a synthetic gem. Cultured right. pearl was was created by human intervention. Same thing. Right. Yet we accept cultured pearls. In fact, you can't even get natural pearls anymore. And if you do, they're crummy looking. But we accept them. And, you know, and in fact, if you buy pearls, they must, uh, if they buy pearls, they must tell you it's cultured pearls. They can't say these are pearls. They must well, say cultured pearls. Well, obviously, so, they're in long strings for right. a dollar a long string. So right. You can't so, be um, <laughs> anything. Uh, so we accept cultured pearls. And I, I would say sometime in the future, we would accept these artificially made gems. You know, I mean, I'm sure Mickey Moto and the other people had trouble when they came out with their culture pearls in trying to sell them. But one of the reasons is natural pearl beds were basically depleted right. by the 1880s. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the only stuff you could find was an antique jewelry. So he came up with these culture ones, and we accept it. And you know, any pearl you buy nowadays is going to be a culture pearl. I'll guarantee it, unless possibly these funny-looking freshwater ones. And we have no problem with it. Why do we have problems with artificially made gems? It's just and it's very expensive yeah. sometimes to find out if it is artificially made. You yeah. got all these sophisticated equipment that yeah, Alan. Because we're not just a sidelight on your cultured pearl thing. Yeah. If you go to Japan, you can actually go to what's called Mikimoto Pearl Island. Yeah, sure, right. And you can then watch as the ama, the woman, right. dives and brings up uh, the mollusk and, right, and open, it open it. You can buy that one. Right. So, but you still think, wow, this must be a natural pearl. No, it's not. No, it's it, was, it was culture. Yeah, exactly. But you have watched it actually yeah, come exactly. from the sea, brought out, and that's the one you bought. Exactly. And then you can have that one mounted. Right. Yeah. You know, it's totally different. Yeah. No, exactly. And as I said, yet we accept that. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, because it's too soon to accept those. We need time to digest That's it. Right. I mean, I saw the other day one, I think it's some store, panties, I think it was. It was artificially created, they call. Right, sure. So I said, it's fake. She said, he said no, artificially created. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just the later, you know, the right. later purse is plastic. No, it's eco, eco made it well. It's, it's plastic. It's a funny. Right, right, it goes. So it was kind of too perfect, Sapphire. And, yeah. you know, you could see, you can't. Right, you know, right. just, so I think it's just soon, maybe yeah. 20 years from And that's why they want to say, uh, and that's why she said, no, no, it's not fake, yeah. it's artificially great. Yeah. It's, the yeah. it's the same thing, but, but fake would not sound good. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what kind of penalties there are, if you've looked into that at all. Uh, if, 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 if it's it's a yeah, it violates our federal law if they tried to sell you a natural thing and it was artificially created. Why so, I mean, if it's I don't, a, I don't, fit, you know, it seems as though <clears throat> if there were a $50 fine, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would be very little incentive. Well, <laughs> gee, the bigger companies, the bigger companies, five years. Right, the bigger companies, the bigger yeah. companies don't want to tarnish the reputation. The small ones really don't care. Now, I will tell you one thing that I have learned, and this is one of the best kept secrets among the Asian community. Most non-Asians don't know it. If you want to buy gold, mm -hmm. do not go to places like Jared's Jeweler or Ben Bridge or K. You go to one of the small Asian jewelry shops. Sure. Uh, and, and you'll get a, a much higher quality gold, 22 carat, yep. 24 is pure gold. And what they will do is the price changes every day. They'll get the spot price. They'll weigh what you want to buy, okay. tack on a small amount for the craftsmanship, and sell it to you. It's one of the best kept secrets because uh, every time I buy my wife gold, that's what we do. And I'm about to be, I'm about the only white guy in the place. <laughs> no, they're all Asians. Uh, and, and, where, and where do people, you know, the, uh, the, the whites, the African Americans, uh, they go to Ben Bridge or K Jewelers. And as like I said, for gold, no. So, uh, some advice would be go and get the stone separately and bring it to one of these places and have it mounted. That's what I did with my diamonds. I had bought them separately and I brought them to this Asian jewel right in Linda Vista, a little old wall place. And, I, and then he showed me various mountings. I said, fine, this is what I want. And they mounted it right there. You have to know it very well. Otherwise, they may exchange. Uh, well, what they do, what they do is I guess there's a 
I guess there's an instrument where you can put it on the diamond to show it's a right, uh, a true diamond. Okay. Now it won't tell you the quality, the quality of it. Okay, the clarity of that. So what they did is when I handed it to them, they tested it to see if it was real. Then they took it and did their thing. Then they brought it back and they did it again to show me oh, there was still okay. a diamond. Now did they swap it? But I'll tell you a story. When I bought my my three diamonds, I wanted them certified. So I was living in New York, so I went to the diamond district. And most people in the diamond district who are involved in the diamond trade are Hasidic Jews, the very Orthodox Jews. So I, I couldn't go to GIA because they were less than a carrot and they wouldn't do it at that time. So I went to EGL. And here I am on the elevator, me, in my, uh, I don't know, I'm not just like this. And you know, everybody else on the elevator are Hasidic Jews. <laughs> and undoubtedly, they're carrying millions of dollars worth of diamonds in their pocket. So I go there, and we go into the, the place, and there's a little window there, you gotta hand them in, and, you know, and I was concerned. I said, how, do, because you have to leave me there for a few days, I said, how do I know I'm gonna get my diamonds back? And they looked at me, they said, and these people on Delhi are walking around with a million dollars worth of diamonds. They bring them here to get them certified. Do you really think they're gonna steal or swap Possibly. your third of a carrot or 20 or, or a quarter? Yes, I could. No. No. Uh, why bother with my crummy diamonds when uh, there's much more expensive you know. ones there? But in the diamond trade, okay, everything is done by word of mouth, okay? And God forbid you violate your word, they'll never deal with you again. So like, for example, when, if you go over to uh, Antwerp, okay, uh, Belgium, and you're buying diamonds, the way they do it is they'll have the diamonds laid out, and you'll sit down opposite each other. And you'll be looking at them, and you'll be discussing pleasantries. But in the meantime, you'll have one hand under the table, and the other person will have the other hand under the table, and you'll be touching hands. And there's various motions you make with your hands, and you're negotiating under the table, so nobody else at the tables, because the one table, know how much you're negotiating. <laughs> and finally, when you reach the agreement, mazel tov. Mm -hmm. And then nobody knows how much you agreed on. It's all secret. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but that's how it's done. Other questions? Uh, I think... Go ahead. Uh, uh, you haven't asked one yet. I'll take you next. Um, when they laser on a number on the girdle, yeah. with the question J, does that really add a little bit to the value? Uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't add anything to the value. Right? It doesn't really take away, but, it, but it's good for... Um, uh, for uh, finding it if it gets stolen or that. Yes, uh, what she's talking about is on the girl, the very thin That's edge, the edge, they'll laser a number on it. Mm -hmm. And it's not seen in the mounting of that, so it doesn't really detract from the value. But it's a, it, it's a security feature. It's a security feature and that. But no, it doesn't add it doesn't to it. Doesn't, take no, no, it, doesn't, I, it doesn't add or take away. It's more security. Um, I think you were next. I have two questions. How much does it cost to have a stone certified? Uh, it depends on the size of the stone. And uh, depends on the size of the stone. Uh, I had mine done back in the 70s, so I don't know what they cost now. Um, maybe. Uh, Is it a percentage of the value? No, no. It goes by the size of the stone. Maybe $100, $150. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the second one, can you speak a little more about um, how, you de how do you determine whether you have um, a red sapphire, or no, let me not, let me see um, a tanzanite versus amethyst? just by looking at you it. You can't. Do you know how to do it in the lab? Or I don't. Fish? They do. I don't. I'm not at that level yet. So how can we be... Know the person you're buying consumer. from. Oh. Know the person you're buying from. Yeah, I know. And what the laboratory is doing, I assume, is, is just... Uh, Various tests. De determining the chemical composition. Uh, well, the, they'll, the, well, they're going to run the specific... Mineral composition. They're going to run specific gravity. They'll run hardness, they'll do a refractive index, they'll do various types of non-destructive tests. Yeah. Then there was a question over here. Yeah. yeah, I want to ask about coral. Yeah. If you haven't mentioned it at all. They're well, I did mention it briefly as a non yeah, yeah. They're incredibly expensive. I mean, That's they're, right, they're because uh, most coral is protected now. What is actually a zircon? I know it's a, it's a thing, ah. but what is it, a zircon? Well, then, let's look it up. Thank you. Uh, you, you do have natural zircons and artificial zircons. Is that oh, so? Yeah, sure do. Okay. Many people have heard of zircon, but have never seen it. Mostly this is because color zircons wide use as a diamond simulant in the early 1900s. 
It was long ago replaced in that role by a uh, it was more, it was, uh, okay, it was long gone replaced in that role by other lookalikes. But the name means, still to many people, imitation. That's unfortunate. Because zircon is a beautiful colored stone with its own fair share of folklore and charm. It's one of the U.S. first stones and it's for December. In the Middle Ages, this gem was thought to induce sound sleep, drive away evil spirits, and promote riches, honor, and wisdom. Many scholars think the stone's name comes from the Arabic word Zarkun, meaning cinnabar, possibly vermilion. Uh, and other people believe the source is the Persian word Zargun, which means gold color. Uh, also, looking at Zircon's color range, either derivative seems plausible. The most common, uh, uh, let's see, the most common color for Zircon's on today's market is a greenish blue that's also, uh, a greenish blue that's often called Zircon blue. Other colors, green, yellow, orange, red, brown, and even purple. Uh, the colors are often light and muted, but the finest stones have strong rich colors. It's one of the few colored stones which might show, which might show, might show visible dispersion. When you're shown this gem, look for flashes of rainbow-colored fire. Okay. Uh, the supply of true zircon is limited, and typical sizes depend on color. Blue or green stones range from one to ten carats. Yellow and oranges up to five carats. Reds and purples are smaller. Most colors are, it says most colors are available in fancy shapes, but colors and blue zircons are often fashioned in a style known as the zircon cut. Zircon has medium hardness, and the heat treatment that produces many of its colors might also make zircon brittle. For this reason, it's safest to recommend zircon in earrings or pendants or in a protective ring setting. This will keep the gem from becoming scratched and abraded and make it less vulnerable to back fracturing. And there's zircons here yeah, and all different colors. What then they have artificial zircons, which would be a cubic zirconium. By the way, uh, also many gems are treated when you buy them. Now, they are supposed to notify you by law if the gem you buy has been treated to enhance the color or to try to cover some of the inclusions of that. Okay? Some gems, the treatment is so common, it's assumed. Okay, like sometimes, so I forget which one it is, but one gem by eating it, the color will be richer. And it is, and you just assume, well, any gem you buy of that type has been treated. Okay, but they must tell you that, yeah. So anyway, that's something about zircons. Other questions? What's that book that you were just reading? Uh, this the book here yeah. is, um, <laughs> is the Essential Colored Stone Reference Guide. Ah, okay. And um, it's all the, it's, 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 it's your major, um, it's your major jewelry stones here, ah, so and, you can get, yeah, that's a good and it tells about. where they come from, uh, their hardness and toughness. Uh, also mentions, uh, uh, let's see, their care and cleaning, stability, imitations, and alternatives. What's the name of it again? Uh, well, you would have to contact the Gemological oh, Institute of America. Okay. It's called the Essential Colored Stone Reference Guide. I got it as part of one of my courses. Okay. Essential Colored Stone Reference Guide is put out by GIA. Uh, the date of this one is 1999. Or you could always, if you want to go into other things, you could always get something like this here, gemstones of the world. But this would be more than just gemstones. This would also be like various minerals and stuff like that. That's nice color pictures. Some of the pictures I showed came from this book. And th but this goes into much more detail. This will give you the chemical composition, the answers for various types of tests, like for example, uh, talk about refractive index, talk about, um, the, the fracture, the way it fractures, its density, its hardness, the color of the streak, and things like this. So this is more detailed one. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry. In the diamond trade, De Beers is famously yes. um, uh, one, a regulator of supply. Yes. Uh, which relates, of course, to price. Is that true among other gems? Is that is that true among, like, rubies? Or only, only a few gems. Uh, I don't know which ones offhand, but there are a few gems where there's, like, only one or two supply. Okay, and they can regulate the price. But overall, I'd say no. Is okay. it is it uh, as chronic as I've read uh, that, that De Beers controls supply? They do control supply. Yes. It's just very so effectively, yeah. which yes, they they control it. Yes, very which determines price. In fact, it was De Beers that really got diamonds as the thing for engagement rings. It was their advertisements that they started doing. A diamond is forever. The beers really marketed diamonds. 
because uh, you know uh, it made them the preferred stone for engagement rings and that. Prior to that, other stones were used, but the beers really pushed it. And yes, they do control it. They they do. And the area they have is controlled by armed guards and everything. And that. In fact, they even control they even patrol along the beaches because the diamonds can be found in the sand and that. Do you know about serpentine? Have you heard of that? Yeah, I thought about it. Can you tell me where it's from or uh, well, let's see if it's in my book. I brought a, a bracelet, and I wanted to know if it, the purple um, bits to it were, was, if it's all serpentine, or if there were flecks added to it. Uh, let's see, serpentine, if I, let's see if I can find it, yeah. There's natural serpentine, like on Catalina Island. Right. Well, Especially, isn't serpentine like the... California mineral or something? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Well, yeah, let's see here, page 202. But yeah, serpentine is found in a number of different places. Okay, here we go. Serpentine. Uh, there's two, all right, well, let's skip over that, two structures. Uh, Afghanistan, China, New Zealand, and the US. Okay, the color is green and yellowish. I just do stuff. I don't know. What is one now? It's in the coast. Does it say about, does it say care? Uh, uh, this doesn't, no, this doesn't. Um, no, and this book didn't have it listed. Okay. What is the moonstone? Ah, yeah, oh, moonstones are pretty. I always show a picture of that. And they bring good luck, they say. Let's see, do I have a picture of the moonstone? Oh, here. Here's a moonstone. Oh, beautiful. Yes. Yeah. What is an example? Uh, what is a moonstone? Uh, according to Hindu mythology, moonstone is made of solidified moonbeams. Many <laughs> other cultures also associate this gem with moonlight. Uh, and it has a phenomenon known as a duorescence. The visual effect is reminiscent of the full moon shining through a veil of eye thin clouds. Legends say moonstone brings good luck. Many believe yeah. that it's possible to see the future if you held the moonstone in your mouth during a full moon. It ranges from semi-transparent <laughs> to opaque. Uh, let's see, oh, uh, often it's in a carbon shop uh, form, so it's not faceted. It's also popular in bead necklaces and bracelets. It's usually colorless white or light bluish gray with a white or blue adolescence. Other colors include light green, yellow brown, sometimes gray to black. The market supply is normally steady in sizes up to 25 carats. Large stones available in limited quantities. Along with, uh, along with the Alexandrite and cultured pearl, it's one of the US birthstones for June. Uh, Burma, India, Sri Lanka. Its hardness is about a six to six and a half on most scale. Uh, it's, it has a very, uh, in terms of toughness, it's not very good for toughness because it can cleave. Um, what does that mean? Break. It can break. The hardness would be scratching, the, the toughness would be okay. breaking. Um, high heat or sudden temperature can cause it to break. Light does not affect it. It's uh, and that. Okay, in cleaning it, never use ultrasonic cleaning, never use steam cleaning, only use warm soapy water. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's, I almost I almost included a picture of a moonstone. It's a very pretty stone. Yeah. Historically speaking, the very high class people would have this beautiful jewelry and they would make a reproduction and they wear it. They, they, and they the still real do. one was in the bank. That's yeah, they, they still do. Uh, and like then it comes down to uh, the, the statement she was making earlier. You know, like, why wear the original one when the yeah. real one, when the artificial one looks just as good? But no, that's true. People like Elizabeth Taylor. She has these copies made of all, and she has, keeps the original stuff in the bank, in the vault, but she wears the phony stuff. I think it's something in our psyche. We have the original. Yeah. <laughs> I have the original. I have it. It's original. It's not fake. It's original. I mean, like, for example, why do people go out and buy the clothes by the famous designers when you can get the knockoff for, like, one-tenth the price? <clears throat> right? In Taiwan, I had a jeweler there who sold phony Rolex watches. And most of the phony Rolex watches, the hand moves like that. Right. He had phony ones where the hand was a nice full sweep. Yeah. The weight was about the same. And I brought one back for Mark Linsky. 
<laughs> and Mark Lenski wears it all the time and keeps his real one locked up. And he goes, Ken, you can't even tell the difference because it's a nice, smooth, sweet pan. It has the same weight, it looks the same. And, and he loved it. He said, this because all the funny ones he saw were this. You right. can tell them right away. But Mark loves it. Is it heavier than the real one? Uh, it's about the same weight. Of course, is it different having a real Van Gogh versus... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something else. Yeah, that's a little something. Something else. Yeah, that would be. Anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ken.